All right, everyone, we got uh, another guest here, uh, Brogue Leader, a.k.a. Joel, ended up, I've seen him around uh, quite a bit on the GLC server, uh, talking and, and sharing information with folks, and just recently we finished the original core in which uh, uh, Joel ended up coming in third place on it. And so I figured I would have him on to talk about some of the cards in the next set here that we've got going on because we're getting ready to start uh, Ret Runner uh, really round two, which is the core set plus the first three data packs of the Genesis cycle. So I figured we'd get in here and just kind of share a little bit about our uh, initial thoughts slash uh, thoughts from seeing them around because obviously this isn't an initial thoughts necessarily because these cards have been around forever but they are uh, in some ways uh, some of them I've never played with before and others uh, as Joel will tell you he played with them later on in the meta so at this point we're looking at uh, them kind of from a current card pool situation and trying to just kind of talk about their value potentially and, and what's kind of changed as far as maybe deck archetypes from core from what we can see so far getting into uh, getting into this next card pool. So I'm going to uh, let Joel share a little bit about himself and let him tell you about uh, his Netrunner story. So Joel, it's a pleasure. Um, yeah, so um, I'm basically kind of a nobody in the Netrunner scene, apart from sort of one claim to fame, which I'll get to, but um, yeah, I started playing, um, well, I bought the game in like early 2014 and uh, proceeded to not find an opportunity to play it at all for ages, and then uh, started playing, started going to like regular uh, meetups. I, I guess either late 2014 or early 2015 um, um, started uh, started actually getting like seriously competitive in 2016 and that's sort of where I started getting actually good at the game and then um, uh, have just sort of maintained a sort of very middling presence ever since um, uh but yeah, so so like in 2016, that that was uh, when they introduced uh, when Damon took over and introduced the uh, most wanted list for the first time, um, and uh, I just managed to really read the meta right for um, the first store championship that was under that uh, new meta, and uh, I took an NEH deck that was called Eight Influences Too Much Influence. Uh, because it spent all of its influence on two biotic labors and just coasted to victory, <laughs> um, and <laughs> uh, and um, uh, and uh, a gang sign Leela deck that uh, made uh, Alex White so salty that he made a podcast about it. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> wasn't even gang sign. It was I won with a Hades shard. I was just being very cheeky. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, so, so I, I guess I sort of started being very, like, I had, I was playing with the full card pool from, like, around the start of the lunar cycle. I remember, um, Lotus Field being the new hotness, because you couldn't yog it. Um, and, um, um, and, yeah, I've, I've been, like, playing, um, Netrunner that then split into standard and other things uh, ever since. I mainly play standard, but um, but I've been really enjoying Rat Runner, um, sort of going back to the early stuff and reapplying things to it. Yep. So you never uh, you never took a, a break or anything from the the various cycles or whenever FFG ended support of it. Really, no. I kind of I did. Like, um, 2016, I played very, very aggressively into the competitive uh, season, and other seasons, I think I've, I've like not, um, not attended like half as many tournaments as I did in 16. Um, but, but I've maintained a pretty sort of stable, <laughs> um, uh, 
involvement in um like like I go to what I can go to and like I try to I try to compete in last year was my first worlds because it's never been cost effective for me to actually go to worlds um until worlds was just on the internet um but um but otherwise like i'd always try and make it to uh nationals in the uk and to euros if euros was in the uk which it was for uh three euros this is hmm. so um what place did you come in worlds last uh, year Oh my goodness! My world's performance last year was abysmal. <laughs> can, very bad worlds. Can um, be any worse yeah. than mine. <laughs> um, oh, I, I can't remember what my finishing place was, but like, um, I did like I was on bottom table at one point. It was and the split, which is like that's that's a real humbling moment <laughs> when you split on bottom table. Really. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just like swept all my other games so it was so i sort of managed to like claw back some dignity but i i, I was like i th i think i i i didn't have even a 50 50 record last year in worlds it was it was pretty poor yeah normally i'm normally i'm at least like top 50 percent and like if i'm doing if if i'm like playing decent i'm comfortably top 30 percent usually but but yeah i've kind of slipped out of the meta i think hmm. so did you um do, are you into other board games or other uh, lcd slash uh ccgs as to why you kind of picked up the uh core set back in 2014 well i i love board games i play i've got far too many board games man, many of which are still like shrink wrapped uh <laughs> So um yeah like um uh I'm really into the sort of hobbyist stuff but um Netrunner's definitely the first like competitive card game that I picked up and to date the only one really unless you count um Slay the Spire uh but um which isn't competitive but um yeah Netrunner I picked up um after reading like the the two years that it had existed by that point um reading uh loads and loads of glowing articles with different takes on it and i think the one that sort of tipped me over was there was a collaborative article on shut, shut up and sit down about the process of learning it mm -hmm. um that uh, that quinns and lee alexander wrote um which was uh like that just sort of pushed me over the edge and I bought it that afternoon and then proceeded to leave it in the shrink wrap for six months or so. Um, but then started, like I got it out during uh, a lunch break at work and and with uh, a friend there, just sort of, we tried to figure out <laughs> from the terrible core rule book. Yep. Make it, making all of the making all of the classic uh, newbie mistakes like not realizing that the runner starts with MU and that kind of thing, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, until uh, eventually like I had played my first game with the rules correct and uh, just completely fell in love with it. Yep, absolutely. Well, um, so I'm glad to have your expertise here today because we're going to get into these cards here. Uh, and so you'll definitely have a more long-term view of them. I've played some of them, but uh, I'm not nearly as well versed in the card pool. I've uh, a lot of times stuck with Rhett Runner card pools and a lot of, you know, just some playing some of the same cards over and over again versus really spreading out and trying different factions a lot. So... I'm kind of uh, still getting used to it, but this is definitely a great way to introduce and, and systematically starting with a small card pool and working your way up so you can really get a feel for some cards. So I'm having a blast with it. And so here we go. Uh, the first the first uh, faction we're going to look at here is HB. And the first three data packs, again, it's uh, it's Trace Amounts, it's Cyber Exodus, and what's the, uh, what's the third one? Do you remember? what lies ahead what lies which ahead is the first three. yep so those three data packs 
most uh, most of the factions get eight cards. There might be uh, I, I'm thinking almost all of them get eight cards in, uh, for those three uh, packs. And so looking off first here, let's look at the the this other ID ID here for HB. So from my my perspective, I definitely see some ice that could benefit from from this stronger together, along with adding in that upgrade that gives you some plus strength and everything. You can get um, you can pretty much get your ice up to where clearing a data sucker might be able to keep people kind of out of your your HQ and everything uh, instead of having you know like the the victor which is three strength which means as soon as you deploy a yog it's basically useless things like that so I can see some benefit but from my perspective and from what I've heard from everybody else and it might be my perspective might be kind of pulled from there from all that I've heard uh, throughout different articles and conversations is that ETF is is just it it just gives you the money it keeps you I, I love it you're able to deploy one card and grab two bucks and you were able to do something on your turn and get three bucks it just gives you a whole lot of flexibility uh, you know to be able so to keep thing, doing right? stuff yeah like stronger together i think i think it's quite telling that stronger together um was uh was the like default um hb identity in both of the not original core sets that we've had. Right? <laughs> yeah, because ETF's so good, right? Yeah, because it's like, there's nothing strictly wrong with Stronger Together, but when you compare it with just raw value, raw mm -hmm. value is going to win out. Yeah. Um, like, um, Stronger Together requires you to, to build a very specific and quite predictable deck, um, which, like is it's also the case with say like architects of tomorrow is also a sort of bioroid synergy thing which gives you value but it's still a bioroids thing so um so immediately the like your opponent across the table has a really really narrow view of like what all your threats are and knows that face checks wise um, especially at this point in the game, there is nothing that they can do as long as you've got a click left. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. so you're not only not getting the value from the install, like you're not maintaining the tempo that um, the ETF gives you, but um, when you res, you're not really likely to hit them with anything hard unless you're building a deck that would be definitely better in ETF. Like if you if you go well, I could be stronger together, but play things that aren't bioroids and uh, and surprise people. It's like fine, but you can also do that in ETF <laughs> for sure. No, for sure. And at that point, you're getting a benefit. Um, yeah. So so that's it's it's always just been this sort of um, this uh, sad, lonely stepchild that uh, just by uh, virtue of comparison, it's like criminal consoles next to desperado um is stronger together next to uh yeah. etf yeah yeah um and and then just looking at the tournament rules right the way we the way we do tournaments here in, in at red runner is basically you give your id right you're gonna s submit your ids at the beginning of the uh, the tournament and you can change any cards in your deck week to week but you have to stay with the same ids and you're able to see what your opponent is for that week so if i came across a has byroid stronger together i would probably slap in an e3 uh into my into my deck because i yeah. know all i gotta do is use one click so you can tech against it as well which makes it even you weaker can, in this format you just start three e3s and and no breakers that week just to see what happens yeah for sure <laughs> yeah definitely so that makes it even weaker in this format that we're doing here i think for for red runner so but anyway that that's the idea id i definitely think that uh etf is going to be your stronger move if you're interested but hey sometimes people just want to play some cool decks so you know there's still a it's still a viable option i'm sure you could put together something that's pretty pretty taxing on the runner so getting into the agendas here the big thing here is Project uh, Vitruvius. I think Project Vitruvius, as well as the money from ETF, is definitely making this the strongest fast advance at this point in the game. And it is uh, just kind of setting HB apart as probably one of the strongest corps in the in the current card pool, right? Would you agree with that? 
Absolutely. Like um, Vitruvius, uh, like means that uh, HB is the only faction with two three twos right now. Um, uh, obviously, MVN has additional fast advanceable things, um, and so does Wyland. Um, in the fact that they've got two ones, but a three two will get you much closer to winning for sure. Um, and um, uh, also just the the over advance ability on Vitruvius is incredibly strong. Um, so when you have the opportunity to get a counter, like the fact that you can clicklessly pull something from archives uh, to just thwart noise or to just get your money back on track or anything like that is so so powerful like if someone runs in trashes your Santan city grid for for uh the fortune that that costs and then you just instant speed pull it back and first click put put it on the table (laughs) like um it's uh it's very very strong um it's it's definitely like of there's two really really major big deal cards uh in this uh set of uh editions and that's one of them yeah for sure and that and that just comes down to basically wayland is taking a hit because of the plast creek caprice which we'll get to in a little bit that pretty much uh that pretty much just sets them up to have even less of a chance to pull off that kill. So at that point, you've got MBN, which isn't as good on the money and doesn't have as many of those three twos to advance. And so it kind of like, again, I'm not telling anybody to run HB. I'd rather you not uh, for my sake, but it, uh, you know, run whatever you want. I'm not running the strongest runner as we'll get to in a little bit, but I just want to play something that's fun. So it's all about what you want out of the tournament, but I definitely would say HB is is looking really nice and actually kind of takes away that gap between the runner and the corp, right? It takes away the before in the original core, the runner is so strong compared to the corporation. You can you can actually win, you know, relatively often with with this HB deck and from what I've seen so far in my playing of it. Yeah, like you still you still need to be a little lucky. Uh-huh. Um it's not it's not half as consistent as fast advance eventually gets, but um but it's uh definitely one of the more consistent corps that you can build right now, if not the most consistent. Yep. So the mandatory upgrades, this card is one that I just, I think a lot of people just want to pull off because they feel super proud of themselves. But once you do pull it off, it, which is hard, it's hard to get off. But if the the one out of five games that you do pull it off or however many, I might be, that might not be enough games. You're yeah, sitting real together. pretty. <laughs> you're sitting real pretty for the rest of the game with a, uh, with, with an extra click, especially with all those three twos, you're pretty much just uh, able to not even spend the extra money on the biotic labors or the sand sand grid and pull out your your three twos at ease. Yeah, man ups is is fun. Um, I guess I can't really see like it's always been kind of a meme card, right? It's a sort of it's a silly like you've you just you're right like you you're scoring manups for the pride of it rather than rather than including manups in your deck because it's uh critical to your strategy because ultimately like the stars have to have to align perfectly for you not to see that turn up in your mandatory draw and go oh <laughs> oh it's this <laughs> now I've, now i've got this in my hand yeah absolutely so the uh, the the uh, one asset that HP gets is encryption protocol, and I actually I actually really like this card uh, for for this is deck dependent. Obviously, this one is, but at this point, slapping that out there along with all the pad campaigns and Adonis campaigns that you got uh, currently for for money really causes them to either come in and get rid of that, or they're going to be paying a hefty tax for each for each of those money cards that they're trashing along the way and to include San San City Grid if you're running a fast advance, which you probably are. So this one I think is a, a definite include in the deck if you're if you're trying to if you're running H B at this point. What do you think about it? Um yeah, I mean I've the the 
like I'm considering um, ETF fast advance for for this tournament, um, and the build that I've got at the moment doesn't have encryption protocol in it, um, just because uh, essentially what you're putting, what you're taking out for it, is money, um, and money is always the most important thing. Um, to have but like it's it's a legit card it's like the zero res the fact you'll put it down gaining an etf credit as well um the fact it taxes another click for, for them to go and hit it and then that wasn't even worth it if they don't immediately trash two things um is like that's strong and it, it only it only gets stronger when asset spam kind of actually makes waves later in the matter um right now there's just sort of it's adonis campaigns which are cheap enough that you typically protect and pag campaigns that um are weak enough that you typically don't need to um but um but obviously um being able to just have that reliable drip and just to be able to put all of those cards on the table um going wide rather than holding on to them to chain them or whatever um is a benefit but yeah like i i think for for my money i would i would rather like have even though melange is terrible i would rather have two melange mining corps than two encryption protocols yeah um uh alongside my adonises and my pads just because um I can use those and get rid of them and they've given me some value um rather than uh just made it marginally more costly for the runner to do stuff because in fast advance what I'm concerned with is how fast I'm going how much tempo I have and like fast advance is expensive like you need six credits up front to buy or a card in ETF um and uh you need six credits to res a sansa uh so yeah um, now I'm so, with you. so seven credits to, to score like an abt off a of sansan um which you can reasonably expect will be trashed um the turn after unless they can't access it and if they can't access it like that's that's the value of your ice not the value of you making it cost one more Sure. Yeah. And I mean, you obviously got Imp as well as Wizard in the mix that uh, can pretty much really devastate any type of open yeah. open assets at this point. So when you get into that, it is a card that, that comes out immediately alongside its own like silver bullet. Definitely. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. Like you've got you, you've got encryption protocol, but then you've got a card that ignores trash costs. Oh. Yeah, and it's a virus, and it's a good virus. So, if you're ever against noise, he's running three. Right, absolutely. Yep. So, I mean, that's just uh, that's just kind of uh, it. It is a card that I definitely I'm liking. I'm enjoying it. I could. I'll see how it goes uh, as we continue on. Luckily, you can pull cards out of your deck. But there's two different sides of the coin. One person uh, is not fitting their deck and another person it is. So it's definitely one to consider in your fast advance because like you're saying, you're worried about how fast you're going. But for me, sometimes those agendas don't get there fast enough. And I'm really trying to make the I'm <laughs> trying to make the runner go over there and spend money and spend clicks and waste time so that I give me some time to keep on just because in this game, I get a buck for just installing that card, right? So boom, I get a buck. Now they go over there and waste their time doing it. I just kind of save myself a, a little bit of time to keep waiting for my for my agendas to show up and keep doing stuff that uh, to kind of advance my money situation. So that's just another way to look at it. And but we'll find out who comes. There's a reason why you were number three in the tournament and I was number eleven. So we'll find out which way is better, right? <laughs> which dot process is better there? So. All right, getting into the ice here. We've got um, we've got really. I think Janice is the one that sh that looks awesome, and uh, but at the end of the day, at this point, for my for my thought process, I'm like I'm not about to res that unless I've got either an ABT taking a chance in my deck with a accelerated beta test, 
and, or a priority requisition uh, most of the time. That's kind of where I'm at. Where are you at with Janice on that? I would agree. I don't. I don't think you're very likely to hard res with Janice uh, unless un unless the runner has just not harassed you at all for the whole game, mm -hmm. uh, and you've you've just been like chaining Adonises and uh, and just like never advancing agendas rather than fast advancing them. So you're just full of money. Um, paying fifteen uh, is just not going to happen. Like the. The cool thing about Janus is that there's more subroutines than the runner is likely to have clicks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, if they run first click, one of them is firing, um, and then their turn's over. Or more, more than one of them is firing, and then uh, they get to do something. Um, but, like, so, so that's really, really nice. And eight strength is really good for a sentry. Because sentries are always hard to break anyway, especially at this point. Like your best bet would be, like double pumping a ninja. That's still crazy expensive. Yeah. Um. Even even like a fem, you would need to pay nine to put it on the table anyway, and then it's still four, which is a reasonable tax. Um. But um, like, it. Uh. Yeah, it's fifteen credits, so you're not. It, it, if if you weren't gonna pay to res a Hadrian's wall in core, you're not gonna pay to res a Janus in core plus what lies ahead. For sure. Yeah, I, I think I've seen it as probably more like a one-off card that you're hoping to just pull uh, an ABT with, or you're looking to you're looking to have in hand, or be able to have out and prior wreck it pretty much. Usually. Yeah, I, I think that's likely. Um, uh, yeah, you just you, you slot it for that one time. It's a bit like mandatory upgrades, but it doesn't take up any of your agenda points, so it doesn't also screw up the build of your deck. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but I will um, say this: once you get into blue uh, blue sun coming up in the near future, it'll definitely be something that's a little bit more you know can, uh, an include in things there. But for now, it's kind of just you're trying to pull off one of those two combos really with it. Yeah, that's right. Like Blue Sun kind of inverted the sort of understanding of the value of high cost ice, where it's like you want all of the most expensive ice because it gives you money. Um but um but right now and for a lot of Ret Runner to come, uh Janice is it's wishful thinking. <laughs> a one of wishful thinking card. For sure, for sure. <laughs> So the other one here, and we won't spend too much time on this one, but because we actually talked about it in the chat the other day, Sherlock 1.0. This one definitely uh, appears to be kind of a niche ice that hadn't got seen a lot of a lot of play in comp in competitive play, but it, it definitely is a, a kind of a fun ice. And what y'all were saying the other day is that basically you put it in front of something that if you put it in front of another in the run ice, you can kind of, it kind of bonuses that beefs that up just a little bit and, and all and causes a, and it's a decent tax. If you're not going to, if you're not going to get, just click through it for, for a century breaker. So. Uh, like it Sherlock one is not a bad ice, but it's, it's just sort of fighting with, uh, fighting for deck space with ice. That's maybe better. Um, like I'm, I'm, I've slot, I've slotted one in my build just to see if every so often when I pull that Sherlock, if it does any work. Um, but because I've, I've always had some fondness for this card. I think it's, I think it's, it's completely serviceable. But, uh, but yeah, the fact that you can, you can click through, like, it's sort of competing for space with Itchy in that it's effectively taking programs off the board. Um, but it costs one more and has one fewer subroutines. Um, obviously, it's it's also higher strength, so it's a little bit more of a problem for data like a mimic, which is what you're mainly expecting, I think. Uh -huh. um, but um, it's yeah, it, it's just sort of it's fine. <laughs> like it can be very taxing. But it's it's sort of a situational piece. So yeah, I've slotted one to see if see if those situations emerge or not. For sure. 
So you're probably looking at putting this one on a uh, on a remote server, though. Would you say, uh, or if you're if you're doing it, what's what's kind of your your strategy with this one if you are going to use it? In front of something something gear checky like a wall of static or a chimera or something, or it would go on R and D just to make medium a miserable experience. Mm -hmm. That's because, right. Because like it is it is taxing and you need that program on the board. Um, so you're you're either paying clicks through it, in which case you're not digging as deep as you would be otherwise, or you're paying through the traces, which are really expensive, um, or you're breaking it, which is really expensive. Yeah. It's, um, it's or you're down. parasiting it and it's five strength so that's going to take a bit of time and that's not too bad that is a good point i mean that's a great piece of ice for medium because the whole goal of medium if, if, is if you can make them only be able to medium one time per turn that's a lot better than them doing it two three times each turn right so uh it'll well, definitely slow that down definitely like the big the thing the thing with medium that that makes medium scary is when you're forked because uh the runners trashed your r d ice or trashed all of your relevant r d ice so medium is effectively free um and so purging will do nothing that's mm -hmm. that's the situation right yeah. you can purge the medium but that means that uh that they just build the medium up again because you've spent your turn doing that or you can uh, you can let the medium build even further by building up your defenses, and then purge later, um, which means that whilst whilst it's more costly to access, they're still getting more value out of that access than they would have been if you'd purged. And that's the that's the tricky fork. High strength ice is good for handling that. High strength taxing ice is a nice option to have. That and things that do annoying stuff like Data Raven. For sure. Yep, absolutely. I just want to go back to my mandatory upgrades real quick because it looks like that, I mean, I know it's not, but it looks like that's a top hat, right? It looks like that's a top hat and then a microphone like into the guy's face there. I'm always like, what is this on top of this this guy, right? <laughs> I haven't really looked at that art properly before. Um, yeah, it's like a sort of it's that or it's like a gigantic button <laughs> a sort of panic button to switch it off it goes wrong it's definitely a cool art but that always just throws me off like what is that on top of that thing it's like a microphone and a top hat but but all the rest of it is just like a really cool art i really like that one uh so anyway little side uh, conversation back to so back to ice we got viper now viper's one i'm really enjoying it's basically replaced victor for me for so many reasons right one it doesn't have click it doesn't click through it's it's four strength instead of three which means until they get that yog data sucker rolling strong it's it's definitely doing its job the the challenge is obviously the trace the the trace challenge so you got to have money but usually etf is doing all right in that part and worst case scenario it's going to be a three to six six credit tax for the runner if they uh the break both of those traces so i'm really i'm really enjoying it it does get weaker towards it does get pretty weak towards the end of the game but it usually holds strong all the way into you know middle mid game sometimes even late mid game depending on what their breaker sweep is and if they're able to get that yog and data sucker out i like viper a lot um I, like the traces are strong enough to be a nuisance um it's it's basically just um enigma but with traces um and one strength higher which means that yog doesn't immediately invalidate it um so it it absolutely does the job of of like early to mid game tax um, and for three credits, I think that's pretty respectable. Like, this is this is the best thing that fills the Eli slot until Eli comes out. <laughs> mm. Yep, no, for sure, definitely. And then the last card here for HB, we're gonna have to break this up into different videos, I think, because we're we you know we're going a little pretty in depth, which is fine. So we might just uh, uh, split this up here and uh, in each faction potentially. So we got uh, so we got Ash here ash obviously yeah i don't think we have to I, this one right here is a beast and it just 
it just completes the p pyrite here it just completes the whole puzzle with these eight cards here i think to really take hb to that to that next level at this point and get it out of just uh, pure misery against a criminal deck uh, but uh, against the runners really period but pr particularly the strength of the criminal deck and uh, so ash ash is a trace four no matter what okay they they can either they can either let the trace fire and just trash ash and then have to come back in for your ice i mean for your card or agenda or they're gonna sit there and spend the the trace money which you can advance again a lot of times etf has the money to do so and so they've got to spend that money and what i really like doing with ash i'm not gonna lie i, I probably shouldn't say this because i'm giving away some secrets one thing i like the, about ash is you can throw in you can throw in a card like adonis campaign or something like that right and and make them go through all the work of uh breaking through all your ice and then breaking the tray making the trace unsuccessful so they can access that card and then they're left to be like uh oh i don't even have enough money to trash this adonis campaign uh this turn <laughs> and it's just all a big waste right so that's a that's a beautiful play in the midst of ash that uh just finding those windows for your you know your agendas and everything you can definitely do some very mean things with trace math with ash um yeah like Ash protecting a San San just like uh so like either they can they can run in and trash Ash and then run in again and trash the San San if they've got the money to do that. Or you uh <laughs> or if they meet the trace they're one credit short of the San San because that's what you boosted the trace to. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's a fantastic uh tool and it's it's so flexible it's just like a staple of glacier decks for ever um and it's it's sort of because it's like trace reliant it's sort of it's one of those cars that's sort of uh a reminder that money is everything like because <laughs> the the thing about ash is like ash is good like but it's it's only a two credit swing in your favor against a zero link runner uh if you if you can't boost that trace a lot of the time you don't boost the trace anyway even if you can but like um like if you're just if you're just using him basically as an encryption protocol to just say no actually this to access this Adonis campaign you have to pay a bit more money yep um um but um um but yeah like if you're actually defending an agenda with him or, or defending the sand sun you need to win next turn with him like yeah you need you need a money lead um and so having having that consistent economy is is, is so so important which is good because you're hb and you are one of uh only two factions that has an in faction economy card <laughs> at this point yep <laughs> Yep. So uh, absolutely. Yeah. All these cards here as a whole, I really feel, um, I really feel like they kind of flesh out that they definitely do what they were designing the Genesis cycle to do. They flesh out HB and make it, make it uh, much more dynamic, make it faster. Uh, you can, you can definitely just really put the pressure on, which is, which is something you really couldn't do in original core. You just had to like, hopefully get your ice out in the right order so that you could build up a semi tax and server and hope that the criminals cars didn't come out right. Uh, so that you could, uh, have enough time to, and then you needed, you just about needed an aggressive secretary to fire off for you too, to trash some programs along the way so that you could get that win in original core. And now you kind of feel like you're on the offensive. Uh, with HB, so I'm really enjoying the the, the flow of the game. I'm really enjoying uh, playing a lot of these cards and just using them like the Ash and the Encryption Protocol to just throw cards out and get a buck every turn. I mean, it's just really nice to to be able to no matter what happens with that card, I still got a dollar out of it. You know, that's that's pretty nice uh, with with ETF there. Yeah, sure. So. That's my take on HB. I think it's I think it's definitely a, a viable, a, a, the probably the best. But again, I don't want you to deter anybody. And and again, I'll say this. <laughs> 
everybody has their opinions about the cards and sometimes it's pretty objective but sometimes it's just subjective and it's about play styles and you're overlooking certain thought processes we all do it and and, and so there's probably some stuff i'm missing out there from different factions that that makes them just uh, you know have their strengths and as well as the ability for somebody to say i don't really like this kind of deck or i don't like uh or i don't really understand this style of deck but i'm really proficient with this other type of deck that can make a, another deck just as strong for you and there's a couple of different builds with hp at this point because of these cards and the and some of the other cards they could splash in so don't don't let us in, uh, sway you to play a fast advanced hb but definitely understand that I think it's a viable option if you're interested in getting into the fast advanced game at this point. Yeah, for sure. Yep. So, all right. Well, I think we're going to uh, cut record right here and uh, come back with another video. Otherwise, these are going to be really long here. Uh, so... <laughs> <laughs> but I think we I think I enjoyed going through the cards with you uh, Brogue leader and just kind of digging through them and, and getting and checking my perspective and hearing somebody else's perspective about them so appreciate you uh, coming on and, and sharing with us oh no problem it's been great yep we'll catch you next time all right <laughs>